Okay, you get up every day in the morning and you say to yourself, who am I going to be today? And today, you answer the question with Roger Epstein. <laughs> I yeah, that's a good answer. <laughs> that's the answer I want every day. And he is an international business consultant with Lokahi Consulting uh, in the process of leaving Cage, Shirley, Fleming & Wright after 40 Four years there. Four fours. Four four. There's, there's magic yeah. about that. Yes, there is. There is. And five years with the IRS. So let's see. Had I stayed until uh, uh, June of 2017, I would have been practicing tax law for 50, 50 years. 50. 50 Count years. Them. Nobody wants to be able to say that. <laughs> Well, it's too late. I could have had a shot at it, but it didn't work out. So tell us about your beginnings and how you got into this 44-year thing, <laughs> five-plus 44-year thing. Okay. I went to uh, school at the University of Maryland back in 1963. College Park. It College was a wonderful Park. place. It was terrific. It was so much fun, I didn't really want to do any work. <laughs> so that didn't coincide well with myself as a math major. Math, is it? So that? after two years, I thought, this ain't working. I switched to accounting. <laughs> oh. I took a class in business law, and it hit me that I would really enjoy being a business lawyer. Not to mention the fact that my mother was a secretary for the Solicitor General of the United States. That's the, the number one lawyer. Attorney General is the policymaker. Solicitor. Yeah. She wanted me to be a lawyer. As a good Jewish boy, as you know, <laughs> I decided to be a lawyer. All right. So I got out of school uh, where I had a wonderful time, fooled around, and I went to work for the Internal Revenue Service because they really wanted me. The other accounting firm said, your grades aren't so good, uh, and why would we want you? But the Internal Revenue Service said, uh, yeah. We like you. We like you. about you. Well, you graduated from the University of Maryland instead of Ben Franklin Accounting School. We'll take you. So I worked there for about six months, and I realized that this was the government was not for me. And I should go to law school. And now... I had enough worldliness to know that you better do something or you're going to be stuck in some <laughs> hole. So I applied for a number of schools and I got in amazingly at Georgetown Law School, which was far and away the best school in Washington, D.C. where I grew up. Yeah. And uh, what I did, Jay, was I worked all day and I went to school at night. Really? Yeah. So I I'm, have such admiration for people who do that. No kidding. Well, the reason it went well was because I was scared out of my mind. Oh, there you go. I was so sure I was the last one admitted and that they had made a mistake. <laughs> and once I was in the door, man, I, I wanted to stay you there. Stay. Yeah. So I, I went to work at 8.15, got off at 5, walked up to law school about 10 blocks, 5.30, quarter to 6, went to school till 8, came home and studied for two or three hours. <laughs> Five nights a week and oh, a half a day on Saturdays. Oh, oh, oh gosh. And at the end of my first year, my grades were good. I was in the top 10% of the class. I got on the law review, another 20 hours a week. For the law review, just yeah, the law just review. just the law review. So, but that's important. Oh, it was that's important. important. It, it defines your life to be on law review. Well, interestingly, in those days, you know, this is the 60s. So they were trying not to be too uh, objective about it. Everything was subjectivity. So they changed the whole grading system at Georgetown. It used to be all numbers. Well, the whole class was like between 72 and 78. So if you were 72, you're in the bottom quarter of the class. And if you're 78, you know, so it didn't make any sense. So they changed the grading to pass, fail, distinguished. All right. And then they said, well, if you're really good, you get an exceptional. All right. And if you're not so good, you get a, a something else that was a D. So it was like A, so B, C, D. Five yeah. yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> but it was all kind of kapakahi, and you didn't really get ranked anymore. But if you were on the law review, you were in the top 10% of the class. So at that point, you were either there or the bottom 90%. Yeah, that's the message that speaks to people. That speaks to the law firms at Wall Street and all Well, that. it took me into a whole different world, honestly. And, and I really wasn't disciplined in college. I had a wonderful time at college. I'm still good friends with these guys I was in a fraternity with 50 years later. That's another story. What, what fraternity? Ta Epsilon Phi. We that's my fraternity. No. Roger, how come you didn't mention this before? We just started talking. <laughs> all right. You know Larry David? Yes. Larry David wrote the Seinfeld show, one of my fraternity brothers. Yes. We just got a big Tepper reunion while he did a Broadway show. Okay. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay. Back to me. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, it, it took me to another level. College, like I said, was fooling around. 
But here I, I was an honor student at a really good law school. And what I found was the farther you got away from DC, the more in demand you were. Now, I had been working as an internal revenue agent for two or three years. And then I moved to the national office of IRS where they issue rulings on complicated transactions and they answer very technical questions. So I had five years with the IRS. I had a, a, an honors degree at Georgetown and I wasn't competing with, you know, these Harvard Law School guys who had been doing all this other stuff. Yeah. By, oh, by the way, when you were the IRS answering the complicated questions, you were probably specialized on a certain kind of question. What was it? Well, I started out in the accounting periods and methods okay. division. All right. And then I was in consolidated returns, okay. net operating losses. Yeah, I love this. Yeah. And we were uh, uh, an adjunct to the reorganization branch. So if you wanted to do a complicated reorganization, you wanted to know whether it was a net operating loss carrier, whether it was limited, uh, how you filed your consolidated return. So we had about 15 code sections. This is great. And, and by the way, I want to make clear, none of this is intuitive. You, you really have to know the law, however arcane the law may be, and the regulations. Did you know I had a degree in, in tax? Did you I, know that? I, I have no a master's idea. degree in tax from no. NYU. Do you really? Yeah. Don't I had you no wish idea. you went to NYU? No. In fact, I <laughs> tell kids all the time, they say, I'm going to get out of school and I'm going to go to NYU and get an LLM. And I say, you'll learn a hell of a lot more working a year <laughs> if you got a good tax practice. That's true, I have to say. It was true. <laughs> but I mean, there's, you know, you, you, you learn a lot. I took some LLM classes at Georgetown while I was there, but I had no idea you had to. Yeah. Well, I found the tax law extremely interesting. Uh, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> okay. And, and when you know what the rules are, like you know what the pieces are, you can put them all together and create really fascinating things. And when I, so I, I, I fell into this job at Cades uh, through somebody I had worked with at a very large law firm in Washington, D.C. when I was a revenue agent. He was a senior partner, handled this case for this tax-exempt organization. And a couple of years later, when his firm came around, Hogan and Hartson, big, yeah, yeah. when they came around, I said, say hi to this guy, Seymour Mintz. He called me up the next day. I hadn't seen him in two years. And he said, look, uh, uh, we're not looking for tax lawyers, but we're affiliated with a firm in Los Angeles and one in Honolulu. And if you want, I'll give them, a, you know, your resume Click. and give you a recommendation. Click. Yeah. I said, where's Honolulu? This is 1971 <laughs> on the East Coast. <laughs> but I took a shot. I, I, I came out for a couple of years. And what happened was Cades had an outstanding practice. You know, we represented three of the big five companies, Amfac, A&B, Davies. We represented First Hawaiian Bank. That's Honolulu how I met Federal. you, through Davies. Yeah. And, and Dick Griffith. That's right. Dick That's Griffith right. was the, what, chief tax man in He was the dean Cades of the tax law. He was a wonderful man. Yeah. Terrific guy. I had a drink with him in D.C., and that's it. Just one drink with him in D.C. He offered to come, bring me out to really? Hawaii for an really? interview. That's the kind of guy he was, yeah. And we were ter terrific friends. Yeah. Uh, he I was think. a wonderful, I wouldn't say a mentor. He was more of a guy who I was helping him. And when I got to a point where I needed help, he was doing his own thing. Uh -huh. But he was a wonderful guy to work with. And we really did a lot of good things. A lot of interesting, you know, when you got... A hundred million dollars and, and you're trying to figure out how to buy this business and how they can work it out so it's tax free and you and it's all totally legal you just got to know the pieces and you got to have a little creativity it was hard to be a tax lawyer in those days though because there wasn't that much tax going on here in hawaii now. no you, wrong uh, cades had a terrific tax maybe they practice. had a corner on it yeah. it was very small practice but but yeah we had three we had 23 publicly traded companies a lot of real estate deals. You know, we represented Kualoa Ranch. We represented uh, uh, some families on the Big Island that own huge properties that they were trying to figure out what to do with. You see the movie The Descendants? Yeah, sure. That's what they were trying to do to make it so there was enough income coming in so the younger generations didn't want to sell it all and get out. Uh, John Morgan. Is a true story. John Morgan's done a done the yeah. I know that family the uh, over on the Big Island. But John Morgan's done a wonderful job keeping cool all over. You know, it's thirty five hundred acres. That's not a housing still development. Still together, still in business. It's Amazing. wonderful. You go over there. It's 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 beautiful. Yeah, with innovation in every corner of it. And I remember when it, his father rented it and his grandmother as a cattle ranch and broke even every year. Yeah. 
and everybody was like, hey, I'm worth $100 million. How come I ain't got any money? <laughs> and and, and it, it, that's the true, that's a true, that descendants uh, is, ref, is reflective of 10 families I know in Hawaii over my 45 that's years. Interesting, you guys had a lock on the tax brackets we had, in those days. You know, uh, there was a guy at Goodsell who left, uh, what was his name? Uh, anyway, there were two or three firms that were, that were doing some tax, and Dick and I were a good team. And uh, we really knew what we were doing. We made sure we did it properly. And we would have a lot of fun just sitting around brainstorming. How do we do this? How do we do that? And then we had a lot of litigation because the IRS was auditing these big companies. And, and that was a lot of fun. You know, you get these complicated tax issues and you understand it. I mean, the IRS got 20 cases for every one you have. So you can prepare dramatically more than they do, mm -hmm. and, uh, and everything's gray anyway. So that was a lot of fun. You know, half the practice was planning for uh, acquisitions, planning for real estate development or real estate exchanges, uh, and the other half was auditing. Uh, you know, I might have three clients that had five $10 million issues every year. So each one was like its own case. Okay. So I had a terrific practice until the big five started leaving at the end of the 90s, uh, end of the 80s, excuse me. And Dick left in 85 to become the CEO of AMFAC. I came out in 72. So I had about 12, 13 years with him. And then, oh, I got to take over this You're thing. You're a senior you know? man now. Yeah. yeah. And I had some other wonderful clients. Bill Mao was a good client. You know, the Waikiki Shopping sure, Plaza, sure. Business Motors, Plaza, yeah. Loha Motors. Uh, uh, nice man, Bill. I think he died about five years ago, lived into 90s. Um, but I knew all the old Kama Aina families. It was really a great practice, And you saw it Jay. changing. I mean, you saw, for example, the mainland uh, law firms are coming into Honolulu and doing a lot of work here. Isn't that true? Uh, you know, I don't see that so much as an issue. The thing that I see happening is all the ownership has left. So the big five companies, we still have A and B, but they don't own Matson anymore. So mm -hmm. it's not quite as, it's, it's half the size that it used mm -hmm. to be. Matson's mm -hmm. located here and there's still a little bit of work, but they're basically out of San Francisco in the operations. But Amfag no longer exists. Theo Davies doesn't exist, as you know. Uh, a, uh, uh, That's how I met you through, I think it was through. through well, your Davies. office was in the Davies building. We were both building. representing Davies at the yeah, time. Yeah, that's right. You were doing your thing, I was doing that's my right. thing. Yeah. Well, they were acquired by Jardine Matheson out yeah. of Hong Kong. Yeah. And this, this is uh, interesting for me, an interesting part of my career, Jay. What happened was in 19... Was this the most interesting part of your career? I'm the most interesting part of my Okay, because this is the part where I want to take a break. Take a break. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a cliffhanger. <laughs> You're going to find out what was arguably the most interesting part of Raj's career. You don't know yet what it was, but in a minute you will. We'll be right back. Aloha and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. I am Ina Chang. I am the guest host for Small Business Hawaii with Raj Baker. Tune in every Thursday at 2 p.m. and watch us. Aloha. Hi, I'm Ray Starling, and I am co-host for Hawaii's Wednesday Afternoon State of Clean Energy. And with me today is Leslie Cole Brooks, and she's going to tell you what's happening this month with our shows. Hi, everybody. I'm Leslie Cole Brooks, the Executive Director of the Distributed Energy Resources Council, and this month is the focus is on distributed energy resources. We just had a great show on smart grid technologies, and the rest of the month we're going to discuss storage, different strategies, microgrids, and then we're going to have live man and woman on the street from Verge. So it's really exciting, very informative, um, lively, and just worth doing. So. See you next Wednesday. Thank you. You've been sitting there at your computer waiting for the answer to the question, what is the most interesting part of Roger <laughs> Epstein's life? <laughs> now you're going to hear. <laughs> this is on the record, Roger. Okay. Okay. I'm taking this seriously now, Jay. <laughs> Let's go back to 1973. I came in 72. In 1973, two things happened to me. Uh, one, I got started in my international career. Uh, Jardine Matheson bought the Theo Davies Company in December of 1973, and they began investing from Hong Kong through Holland into the United States. It was really fascinating tax stuff because you could do anything. You could, you could work it out so they could invest $100 million 
and not pay any tax on their income in real estate, not pay any tax on the capital gain. Oh, wow. They wiped that out in 81, 82, uh. <laughs> but that's where we were. The second thing was Run Run Shaw, uh, his son, uh, son-in-law was Paul Liu, ran Dean Witter, now Morgan Stanley's office here. Paul had been investing some of his money in, in the stock market, and then uh, he wanted to get into real estate. So he hired Milton Cades, to invest this money from Hong Kong in real estate and movies. Uh, Run Run Shaw, the Shaw brothers, created the kung fu industry in the yes, 60s. Sure. They created the whole uh, uh, genre. Yes. Uh, so now I had two big clients, Jardine Matheson, the biggest British company, and, and uh, Run Run Shaw, one of the biggest Chinese companies in Hong Kong. And I had a travel company that, that needed me to go there, a small travel company out of San Francisco, in order to help them save taxes when the tourists got there and they were making a lot of money going to nightclubs and things. <laughs> so some wonderful stories at age 30, meeting uh, Run Run Shaw and his senior part, his, his CEO and CFO, entertaining them in my two bedroom suite in the penthouse of the Hyatt Hotel. <laughs> this is another story. So I, I got into that. I also hurt my back and, and hurting my back, I had a nasty divorce. I got married just before I started going to law school. My wife got me out here. I'm in the same house we were in. I'm still in that house 42 years later. Yeah. But I hurt my back when we got divorced, and I ended up going to an acupuncturist. And the acupuncturist turned out to be uh, the 64th lineage holder of the Long Hu Shan Taoist Monastery. And I went with, to China with her in 1994. So uh, after she healed my back, uh, she said, you know, what you really want to do is learn how to do Qigong. So I started studying Qigong, Chinese movement with her, in 1974, and learning about Taoism. So I grew up as a kid in, you know, a small, lower, middle-class Jewish neighborhood in Washington, D.C. I move here. I get two Chinese, two big companies out Perfect. of Hong Kong. Perfect. I get in with the Chinese Taoists, and then... Uh, one of my friends is, is, is studying Tibetan Buddhism, and he asked me to look at their articles and bylaws. <laughs> Perfect. So the, I, the intersection. Yeah. <laughs> and so, oh, well, the same thing with the Taoists. She, she, I said, you got a church, you got a clinic, and you got a school. If you put the church on top, you get a really good tax break. <laughs> so she said, well, would you do that? For free? I'm sure. So I did that. And then she says, now that you've reorganized, you've got to be chairman of the board. Oh my so goodness. I became chairman of the board of this Taoist acupuncture school for about 18 years. Well, these things reflect a change in your thinking, a change in your life. No? Oh, it's tremendous. Just it's like open up your whole mind. And, and actually what really happened, my divorce opened up my heart. This is, this is what I, I uh, my wife, <coughs> when she left, I, 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 we were, we're not happy, but you know, you get married at 23, you think it's supposed to be forever, especially 50 <laughs> years ago, right? And so I was, I, I, I had been rejected and I just was miserable and my heart opened up and I began to have empathy for people instead of being this arrogant East Coast <laughs> Jewish tax lawyer, I was now a heartbroken <laughs> arrogant Jewish tax Anyway, between that, opening my heart and finding these different religious studies, and you know, the Eastern studies are so fascinating because they're about bringing peace to yourself. They're about living in a way where you're not greedy, where you're not demanding, and, and that this is the way to enjoy life. And, and the truth is, Judaism's the same thing. It talks to you about being of service. It talks to you about gifting. So maybe there was a resonance there. It was a terrific... In fact, here's what happened. Okay, so, so I learned about those two. I became not just a practitioner, but the, the, the lawyer to the, to the master in both of those traditions, this, to, this, Tao, this Tibetan Buddhist uh, 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 monk here, Lama, Lama Rinchen, wonderful guy, at 29, I'm sitting on the floor, he's in his robes after I gave him their articles and bylaws revised, <laughs> teaching me how to meditate. He was very appreciative. He was, and he, and, and he was so appreciative, he taught me to meditate. <laughs> So uh, at some point, I began to take on some other religions. I, I, my, uh, my second marriage was to a woman who was raised in Catholicism. So I call myself the only Jewish, Christian, Buddhist, Taoist, <laughs> Sufi tax lawyer in Hawaii, maybe in the world. I think you've got it. No competition. In 1990, Jay, 
I was asked to form something called the Joseph Campbell Foundation for Joseph Campbell's widow, who's an Erdman and a Campbell, old Kama'ina families here. Yeah, yeah. Joseph Campbell became very famous in 1987 doing The Power of Myth with, with uh, Bill Moyers. And so we formed this oh, foundation. Yeah. Campbell had studied thousands of religions and looked for the similarities. And he had studied them, and I'd been practicing them. So this was another academic opening to the kind of spiritual opening that I'd found. Perfect. And uh, if, you, uh, if you stay open, you hold yourself open, these things come to you. They, do, they really do. They really do. And you know how I approach things now, honestly? I accept everything is true until proven false. I'm careful <laughs> this is how, different than most lawyers. This is caref I'm careful how I act on that. But I'm totally open to things that I don't know because I know how much I don't know <laughs> and how much I've learned. And I, and I also found that this is totally consistent with the practice of law. If you practice law in a way that your clients come first, you're of service to them, you want to be totally in ethics with them, uh, you want to follow the Tao, you know, the Tao is about being awake and seeing what's happening and, and go with the flows, but not in a superficial way in a meaningful way. So someone comes into your office as a lawyer, you, you're totally present. What are you telling me? I'm not thinking about you're a jerk. I'm not thinking about you owe money. I'm not thinking about what I did last night. I'm completely there with them. And this is very Buddhist, you know. Yes. Be in the moment. Be yes. here now. Yes. So once you learn that, then you say to yourself, what do I need to do to be of help here? And if you know the rules, then you can give them the best results possible. And people want to cheat and they want to cut on. One of my first experiences as a lawyer was a guy who came in and we looked at all his stuff. I said, you should have come here six months ago. We could have worked this out. Well, why don't we just backdate the document oh. six months? <laughs> what do you do at age 27 when this guy is your client? Remember, I had five years experience with the government. I didn't start at the bottom, I was given the senior partner's advice. You in understood. Tax law. <laughs> so I had to make an early decision. And what I said was two things. One, hey, we're just talking about money. If we backdate these documents and we get caught, you're going to jail and I'm going to jail. We don't want to go there. Secondly, we can't get that, but here's the closest we can if we do it properly. So two things. This is a bad idea to break the law. And secondly, here's another alternative that's as good or almost as good. Yeah. And that served me in good stead over the yeah, years. Yeah, over the years. Yeah. yeah. Now, at some point, you became uh, friendly with a guy named uh, Brutaco. Um, Ronaldo Brutico. Yeah, Ronaldo Brutico. Oh, wonderful guy. He was a very guy. imposing character. And I, you, I know you still spent is. a lot of time still with him. Is. You're still friendly with him? Very Can close Can you talk about him. him and what he stood for? Ronaldo, with a guy named Harm uh, Willis Harmon, created something called the World Business Academy. And this is really uh, uh, consistent with what I've been talking about in my own life. So the World Business Academy believes that we're going through the biggest change in the history of the world since Copernicus discovered that the sun does not resolve, revolve around the earth. Because, important. wow, it changed the whole world because at that time, the, the church was in charge of the physics and the metaphysics. And they said, you know, if you say that again, Copernicus, we'll kill you. So they, he waited till he died and his book was published posthumously. And then they, they had to admit that they didn't know what the hell they were talking about when it came to the physical world. So they said, we'll take the metaphysics and you, you guys take the, the physics. physics. So the, met the physics went like this. And the metaphysics went like this. But all of a sudden, the physics said, hey, you know what? We're all energy. We are t E equals MC squared. I mean, what could be simpler? Energy equals matter times a constant squared. Energy equals matter. You, you are energy as well as matter. See, you know what C squared is? four trillion feet per second. If you could shake your hand four trillion feet, it would disappear because it's energy. Okay, so here, get to the point, Roger. So the <laughs> idea is that this energy yeah. is what people talk about, the great white spirit, Keakua, God. It's a universal energy that your body is really energy. The air is just energy. If you took an atom and you blew it up, so the neutrons and electrons were the size of tennis balls, the atom would be the size of the earth. You and me, the air, this table, we're all made up of 18 tennis balls. 
circling the earth. The rest is energy. <laughs> so we're not just close to each other on an energetic level, we're connected. Yeah. So now that we see we're connected, we got to treat each other differently because we're connected. If I screw you over, I'm just shooting myself in the foot. This is what Jesus said. This is what Gandhi, this is what all the great it's masters. the most noble statement of, of mankind. But here's mankind. the difference, and this is what the World Business Academy says. Now we've proven it scientifically. We understand that the energy that these great masters talked about and the religions talked about are real scientifically. And the World Business Academy says, hey, you know what? Business is the most influential institution in the world. And if business live from this consciousness, if business live from the reality of our connectedness, that would change the world. It's more, more uh, significant to people than, than religion or politics. It so binds people together. It, 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 it cuts to the chase right away. It's yeah. not just some theory. It's like, what are we doing every day? How we conduct ourselves. How we conduct ourselves every day. Yeah. Yeah. So the World Business Academy has wonderful masters dedicated to the idea that we need to live and do our business from the reality of our connection. Roger, we only have a minute left, but I'd like to know what your plan is going forward. Okay. With, um, what is it, Lokahi Consulting and, and life. Yeah, well, Lokahi Consulting, I'm, I'm, I'm helping the Chinese invest here in a proper way, doing this properly for them, not cheating them, not, you know, really helping them. For life, I'm committed to this doctrine of living from the reality of our connectedness. I've done workshops on this. I'm working with Chaminade University now to create a master's program on what we call Aloha in business or island business. But running your business from the, the reality that we're connected. And that's what I see at 71 years of age, I'd like to keep doing for the next 40, 50 years. Yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah. That's, that's where I am, Jay. That's wonderful. And you know what it shows me is that uh, you, fully appreciate the notion of having multiple chapters in life, which I think is very important and possible in our time, but also that we, what you, you get from one chapter, you give to another. There's a continuum. And, uh, you know, you, you've been picking up these lessons and ideas and visions of the world in one chapter. Now you bring them together in your own way in the next chapter, which I wish you well in that, right? Really nicely stated. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Pleasure. Down. Roger Epstein, Lokahi Consulting. We'll have him back. He'll tell us more. We will learn.